Tutorios. Welcome back to the Game Addicts Podcast, a show where we talk about the modern and retro video games that we play and collect. I am this podcast player, one Brando, and I'm swinging it solo here today, trying something new, something called Deep Dive. And I'm looking at Final Fantasy VIII. What's going on? Well, if you guys have listened to the podcast before, you know that we have done something in the past called Retrospectives. In retrospectives, really, we take a look at you know some of our favorite memories and stories, and uh, maybe some stats on some of our favorite gaming systems and even gaming series. And we did one episode this year on Final Fantasy VII, where me and Mike sat down and we just kind of you know deep dived, dive deep, if you will, into Final Fantasy VII. And I decided to kind of you know maybe differentiate the two. You know maybe you could do a retrospective when it comes to a series. Or a console, it's like you can kind of be an overall, you can share memories. But what does it mean to dive deep? Because we actually started going through characters and all this kind of stuff before. And and so recently, at the very beginning of September of, of, two, of 2019, September 3rd, I do believe, Final Fantasy VIII Remastered came out on the PS4, Xbox One, Steam, and Nintendo Switch. So I checked it out. I'm an old school 8 fan. I played it way back in the day. And I bought it on the Switch, and well, I mean, just because I have an, I, I had to have a great game like uh, like Final Fantasy VIII on the Switch and portable, hell yeah, you know. Even though I had it on the Vita, even though I could have, technically have it on the PS, whatever, whatever, you know, the Switch, you know, you're gonna have some you know, some updated character models, you know, and uh, you know maybe get some cheats along in there. I'll I'll, I'll talk about all of that. But basically, if you guys are hearing this, I've decided to kind of do this. This is something that I could do on my own. Take a game, take one of my favorite games, whether it be this game, Final Fantasy VIII, or any or any other other games that I love. You know, I can do. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm streaming Mass Effect Two. I'm kind of doing a a live thoughts and playthrough of that. Like when I stream or when I do gameplay, I do that along the way, and I could do a, a solo video just on my thoughts and uh, thing of that. So, so deep dive. I'm going into characters. I'm going into story, and I'm kind of you know I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna run the whole gamut. And I actually have notes. I took notes <laughs> uh, in preparation for this, and uh, you know we'll see how this goes. I, I, I would like to do more. There's probably you know if you guys are seeing this already, that means that this was one a success, or I thought it was good enough. And two, I probably have had my kid by now, which I'm recording this on like uh, the September 30th. Uh, and I just, the reason why I decided to go with eight because it's so fresh in my mind. I just beat the game, and uh, you know eight is a game that's very you know, div- you know, you know, divisive. So I really want to show it some love and talk about this game. If you're not into Final Fantasy VIII, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I'm really diving deep into this game and the history of this game and, and the story and breaking it down as much as I could. But, uh, uh, you know, if, if you're seeing this, if you're hearing this, you know, my kid, we are scheduled. Uh, yes, we actually scheduled the induction uh uh, uh, all for for October twelfth. So I don't know when this is gonna you know come out. Um, I, I I am doing a new episode hopefully this week if the baby doesn't come sooner. But I've also decided to you know as you know if you guys have been listening to the show we 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 do every week when we can. Sometimes we scale it back to once every other week and we're I think I'm gonna actually make that call. Uh, for the rest of the year, just just for when you know, just so that way we can get comfy and everything. I might even do a couple more of these deep dives if it you know works, because it's pretty easy for me to sit down, you know, think, you know, in in one direction, not just cover any news topics and they coming up. Trust me, there's a lot of cool stuff to talk about that I haven't had a chance to talk about on the podcast yet. Hopefully, this week we'll be able to get to do that. Today it's Final Fantasy VIII. So what's Final Fantasy VIII? Well, Final Fantasy is the eight is the eighth entry in the Final Fantasy series, and it came out uh, in North America on 
September 9th, 1999. That's 9999. The Dreamcast also came out on that day. It came out in Japan uh, back in February, February 11th of 99. And then, of course, it came out, you know, Europe, like in October, in, in a PC port, all that, you know, all that stuff came later. But the the thing to remember is, you know, there's a common misconception that the Final Fantasy series didn't sell well at all here until Final Fantasy VII. And that's not really true. The The series sold well. Of course, we didn't get all the games. We only got Final Fantasy I. We got Final Fantasy IV, which is named Final Fantasy II here in North America. Then we got Final Fantasy III, which was Final Fantasy VI. I'm sorry if I've lost you. So Final Fantasy 1 was Final Fantasy 1. Final Fantasy 2 was Final Fantasy 4. Final Fantasy 3 was Final Fantasy 6. We did not get, until years later, the legitimate Final Fantasy 2 and Final Fantasy 3 or Final Fantasy 5. They skipped around. They didn't bring them all over here. And, and essentially, uh, from what I understand, is that even, even the creators... Uh, the people who are developing, they were told by their like money teams, oh, the games didn't sell well in North America. And when you know somebody's like, oh, you know, hey, a lot of people love FF4 and FF6, you know, they're like, what? You guys played that game? You know, they were in shock. Who knows, right? It's like, well, it, but, but it, but it did. It, you know, it did sell pretty well, not as well as, as in Japan, and you know, but it wasn't until seven that they actually got a proper you know, advertising campaign for the Final Fantasy series. And I remember having comic books. You, I mean, you'd be sitting there reading a comic, well, like a Wolverine comic book, and there would be a, like a page. It's like, oh, okay, what's this game? And then you, a few more pages in, they'd have another ad page in the same book, and it would be a big two-page two page print of like Midgar, you know. You know, FF7 was everywhere. You had the television commercials, you had the, the ads in the, in the magazines and the comic books. You know, they sold gangbusters for FF7. And... So because of the massive success of FF7, FF8 did very well as well because they were just like, people were like, oh my God, we need more of this. And people probably bought FF8 thinking it was probably going to be a sequel to FF7. Uh, and of course, none of the FFs, the main number of FFs are sequels to each other. They're their own single solitary stories with their own worlds. And, and only the... They started doing sequels with ten two, so you have like, like ten two, thirteen two. You, you know, like it kind of got crazy. We now have sequels to some of these, but they're all associated. They always have the Final Fantasy like seven Crisis Core, like so. It's like it's associated with that number. You know, it, it gets confusing, but it, trust me, it makes sense if you think about it. But FF eight sold well because of the hype. Now also. You know, uh, showing the commercials and the, you know, once again, eight had a pretty good, you know, advertising campaign and the game look, just looked next level compared to seven. I mean, in, in sheer graphical quality, the, the cut scenes were like, whoa, this is what we, wow, this is crazy, you know? And while sevens did have really good cutscenes, you know, for the time, and the the, the characters were all kind of like like really as a first foray in the three D RPG, so they were you know the main you know, like walking across the like you know your areas that was a bit blocky. You know, in combat, the character models looked pretty decent for the time, but like for the they were all like Cloud had like really teeny little arms and really big hands, and you know everybody was kind of like. Uh, you know, it was almost like they took the same idea or like the same uh, basic, like, hey, let's make the sprite, but make them 3D. Uh, for FF8, they all went with a more realistic approach. But people were just fascinated, uh, you know, by the overall look and appeal of Final Fantasy VIII. And uh, so much so, like, the like game sold really well. It sold about 50 million. 50 million in the first 13 weeks or so. Like, think about that. Well, I mean, it made $50 million. It didn't sell 50 million copies. It's made $50 million. This is in 1999. And from what, if my memory serves me correctly, I, I, didn't, I didn't write this down in my notes. I actually forgot. But it's the number seven on the top selling PlayStation 1 games of all time. I mean, so FF7 is going to be on that list because, I mean, FF7. Um, it you know was it was massive for that, and also it was the fastest selling Final Fantasy game. Period, the fastest selling until Final Fantasy Thirteen, which was released 
on multiple consoles. It released on Xbox 360 and the PS3. I don't know if it was released on uh, PC at the same time. I don't know. uh, Because I didn't look that up. Because I'm an idiot. (laughs) But uh, just that's mind-numbing. Uh, mind numbing, mind blowing that the game sold that well that fast. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything is all hunky dory. Um, this was, you know, they they brought in some new people. Of course, you had the you know, Final Fantasy One, right? You know, that was uh, you know Hironobu Sakaguchi. You know, it, it was supposed to be the last game. You know, uh, the the Final Fantasy it saved the company. So, so they made a sequel, uh, Final Fantasy II. They made that game. Then they made three. Then they made four. Then they made five. And five, they started bringing in some new people. Namely, namely, uh, I, I don't remember his like the full name, but Katase, he ended up becoming the director of Final Fantasy VI, VII, Chrono Trigger, and eight. And then he's been involved. Of course, he, he is the he is the executive producer or something of the Final Fantasy VII remake that's coming out next year. Uh, yeah, he's still involved. You know, Katase uh, is still around. So he directed eight, but this was like you had some new people coming in and other people kind of leaving the series. And this was sort of the first game made up of almost completely new people. They had a lot of new ideas, a lot of cool things that they wanted to try. I mean, uh, they, they did, you know, it's like, let's do the junction system. Let's have cards. You know, let's have scalable enemies. And they all, you know, they did it all. To some mixed success, some people didn't like it. Uh, I know that when I first played the game, uh, I didn't play it right when it came out. I rented it a little while later. I rented it and uh, tried to play it, and I-, I liked it, but I also didn't really understand it at the time. I mean, this is 1999. I was 13 years old, and uh, it didn't quite click with me until a little later. Uh, what exactly I was doing with the like when I first beat the game. <laughs> I had no junctions. I had my base weapons for a lot of mine, guys. Selfie, it was at level 10. Of course, the game's scalable, so maybe you should be allowed level 10. But she was the only one, so the others were a little higher, so uh, the enemies were higher, so she was just getting smashed. I don't know how I beat the game the first time. I really don't. But this game had the first proper translation, and that means a lot. Uh, You had... You know, translations going up like FF7 had some really mixed bag translation. I mean, the sky are sick was one of the best lines. So another one of my lines that not a lot of people talk about is when Cloud falls through uh, off of the plate after the the Sector 5 mission goes bad. And, and he falls through the church and lands on the flowers. And he's like, oh, where am I? And Eris is like, you're in a church in the slums. It suddenly fell on top of me. Gave me quite a scare. Now, she means you. But in the text, it says it. It makes it like the whole church fell down from the plate. Oh, God. And then there was this guy in there. He's like, hey, how's it going? Then she's like, but then it just doesn't make sense because she goes, flowers grow here. I love it here. I'm like, I thought you just said it fell on top of you. Were you just sitting there at your flowers and the whole church? (laughs) Needless to say, FF8 doesn't really have this issue. Uh, It's very well... Translated for the most part. Uh, there's a couple lines in there that are really, eh, if I had the chance, I would change them. Namely, uh, the line that oh, uh, somebody says about, you know, uh, they're trying to hint at two people being married, right? It's like, uh, instead of saying, like, oh, well, yes, of course, they would try to, t- you know, you know, they are married, you know, instead of just saying it, he's like, the pathetic married couples. It just—it's such a weird way to say it. They like—they like, they couldn't take a take a step back. Think about how the scene is going, and like, well, what, maybe we could maybe say this a bit different. Right. It wasn't very well localized for the most part. Now, some of the stuff is great, especially with the, you know the uh, speak of localization. You know, translation is translating it from one language to another. So you have. You have you know Japanese to English, but then localization is changing it to where it's not just the language that's changing; it's inflection, it's slang, it's everything. So like, uh, you know, in some cases, you know, uh, Zell, like he says, like frickin' hell, you know, frickin', you know, 
with no G and just an apostrophe. Hey, you know that that that's actually a really cool localization. And it's like I don't know if anybody would actually say that, but hey, you know, uh, saying it like that and, and having it written, you know, instead of it all being proper English being written, you saying that makes it seem like it's more sensible. You know, it's like wow, this guy would really talk that way. It's meant to just because they didn't have voice acting back then. It really meant to try and help add characterization for these characters. Um. But also there was, you know, the translation suffered a little bit for this game because there wasn't a lot of really good uh, uh, communication between, you know, Japan and North America with the guy, with the team that was working on over here. In fact, there was a dude using a game shark to get the text code out of the game himself to translate it. That's like, what? (laughs) I appreciate your hard work, dude. You know, you guys, I mean, you, you, you did awesome with what you had. But uh, you know, let's let's you know. I said we said they that they wanted to introduce a lot of new things. Let's talk about junction. So I said, uh, so I said junction system. What's the junction system? So in in previous Final Fantasies, you had stuff like uh, you had jobs. You know, you had, like he's a mage and he does magic. You know, he's a warrior or he's a knight or he's a thief and he steals. And uh, and and he and he uses a dagger, a ninja. He he you know, like he do wields and he can throw stuff, you know. Now, uh, you do have a couple of different character types, but everybody kind of becomes the same ish. And what I mean by that is that the junction system, you know, before you would have a summoner or you have someone who actually uses summons, like an FF seven, or you know, and then in as uh, you know, someone six two with the we you know, with with all that stuff with how they do their um, I'm tra- I suddenly can't think of the word now, but um, relics and you know, and the, you would have certain things that that like you could equip. Seven took that a step further with the material where you could fully customize it. It's like you have you have this magic and you have uh, this summon and you and the, you can put. And kind of customize each character based upon their equipment slots. Follow me? Uh, <laughs> I do. I'm sorry if I lost you already. This one, basically, you have summons are used to give you everything. So to start off, you have two summons. You have Shiva and Quetzalcoatl. And you equip those to your party members. So you give Squall, Quetzalcoatl. And you have, uh, you know, Strength. You, you can you can uh, junction strength. First off, you need those uh, you like you need those summons to even get uh, another uh, option in battle other than attack. So you can use uh, you can summon your you can summon your summon. You can draw your magic. You can cast your magic, or you can use an item. And then you have uh, latent abilities that give you like HP plus twenty or mag magic plus twenty percent. You know that kind of stuff. But junction into strength. So you draw your magic. You go out and instead of having like you know fire. You have to go and you draw fire from enemies or from points, and you have to draw. You can hold up to a hundred of them. The more numbers you have, you can junction that spell to your stat to strength, and it will increase your strength stat. So if he had a basic strength stat of eighteen, junction fire, he now has twenty five strength. The higher a quality of magic you have on that stat, the higher that stat goes. So if he has fireaga. You know, uh, then that goes up to 52. So it's now, now his strength stat is even higher, and he's just walloping things. Whop! You know, this tearing through people. And also, uh, you have junctions for you know your hit points, for your for, for for your defense, for your for your magic ability, for your magic defensive ability, for your evasion, for your hit percentage. Then you can also junction into elemental. You can actually add elemental damage to your weapon like you can add fire to that and every time you hit you get a certain percentage of fire damage so it helps if something is weak against fire or if they're actually like fire you know if they're it, they can absorb fire every hit you do will heal them but then you can also inversely do that to your defensive capabilities and make where you are not only immune to fire but can absorb fire abilities and then they actually do the same thing one step further over with status effects you can add status effects to your weaponry Sleep, poison, you know, silence, or you can make yourself more immune to those statuses, depending on how many you have, and then, you know, therefore. So, basically, if you know what you're doing, and know where to get the magic, and take the time in to grind that, without gaining any levels, because there's a way to do it, by learning an ability where you don't gain experience for every battle. 
because this game has scalable enemies. So even the normal enemy fodder will scale with your level. You can totally make yourself overpowered, and that's what I did in, the, in this last run. I did not have a single challenging fight until I got to Ultima Weapon. And that was before I went to the last, uh, second to last dungeon. Like I went there and I fought. Uh, I can't remember what's called now. It's this like floating enemy, like robot thing, and it shoots lasers. That one was the first legit storyline boss that I ever was like, oh, okay, I better actually pay attention here. That is the near the end of the game. And that's all because I took my time to do my work and do my grinding with junctioning. How did I get that? Cards. <laughs> I Seriously. So one of the abilities that Quasicodal, that summon, teaches you is card. You can turn enemies into cards. So there's a card game in the game where you can collect these cards, either by turning them into cards or challenging other players and beating them and getting their cards. And you can turn these cards into items that you can then turn into magic, tools to upgrade your weaponry. And you can have like, you know, uh, restorative magic, ice magic, fire magic. So these different items or these different cards will turn into different things that give you different number of magics or, you know, uh, items for to uh, upgrade. Like I literally had Squalls. You can get his ultimate weapon before you even move on with the game right in the very beginning if you spend enough time. It's very, very possible. I decided not to do that, and I got his second to last right there because it was easy, I, and I had I already had it. It wasn't until like midway point through the game almost that I'm like, all right, I don't I don't need that much more. Let's sit here and let's get the ultimate weapon taken care of. And I by the end of the game, I had everybody's because it didn't take long to do it. Uh, it. It was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Cards, the the triple triad card game is really fun and, and also addictive. How that works is you have a face card, right? So like you like there's like uh you each have five cards a piece, and there's a there's a playing grid of, of nine. So you have you know it's almost like tic tac toe in that sense, but an, on your card each it has four numbers on it, which represents each side up, down, left, and right. So your numbers correlate with where you put them on the on the grid. So if I put a card up in the upper left hand, the numbers on the uh, top and on the left hand side are just ignored the numbers on the right hand side and down those are the ones facing out when your opponent places a card next to that those numbers go to battle so if i have a eight and they have a six they don't win that fight i do however if they had a nine they would flip my card over and they would get a point and then you have different rule sets and all this other things that can affect uh if, like elemental and then combos all that kind of stuff it, it, it's really in-depth but it's also really fun and addictive and uh it, it can be a different way of grinding in the game and that's really what i did this time around i've never spent that much time playing cards in the game before it was always fun and i, and I would do it uh, you know to complete like like the you know like the card game quest that they have in there it's completely optional unlike ff9 where you would actually have to compete in the card game to com to move on in the story Eight is completely optional. You don't even have to do it at all. You don't, you don't even have to touch it. But it's there. And it's an option for sitting there going through battle, drawing spell, drawing that spell, doing this. Okay, I got this spell. So now i got to put that on my magic because you, did you know that it, when you draw magic, the higher magic uh, stat you have, you'll, you'll earn more number of spells each time you draw. So let me draw some more. Let me draw this. Let me draw this. I, okay, so I got 100 of those. Now I can put... It gets old. When you're playing cards, you can kind of sit there and relax and you know strategize and play your play your role. You can even manipulate the rules that way. When you win, you get your opponents like their entire hand of cards that they played instead of picking one or t or like one or whatever. And now, if you have a good hand set up, you can just go through and like grind up and you could just wump all their cards, all their cards, all their cards. And then next thing you know, you've got enough to do whatever magic you want, what the ultimate weapon. It's crazy. It's nuts. <sighs> so where so so next I guess to, to talk about the story like the story in this game some people like it and some people don't uh, I will be the first to say that like the characters in this game are is not a strong suit especially when you're coming off of 
uh, a game games like FF6 and FF7, you know, just to say that that has some really strong characters in those games. And coming into this one, like it's just not the, it, it's not so so the de- so the devs wanted a school days feel. They wanted a, like a more youth because because in 6 and then in 7, the cast members were varied in age. The, uh, some of them are around the same age and you know, some of them are like a little older. Uh, but they kind of wanted them all to be around the same. You know, they wanted that almost like breakfast clubby type thing where they were all like, you know, that's why the garden feels a, a, like it's a, a, it's an academy. It's a military academy. They wanted most of them to go there and be classmates, do that and you know, do that kind of thing. And uh, think about this: like the oldest party member you get in Quistus is eighteen. You know. The the not the lead enemy or the main enemy of the game, Cipher. He is also eighteen and leads an entire army at one point. <laughs> he's eighteen years old, and he's like the head of like the second largest military outfit in the entire world. Isn't that ins- like that's mind boggling to me? <sighs> uh, but. The story for this game is some people have a hard time understanding it, especially with the whole time compression and stuff like that. But the best way that I've seen to describe it is that it's basically a time loop. And what I mean by that is like, like imagine the the line of time is going across. It basically whoop, goes back around and keeps going. And And I actually took notes to kind of try and explain what I mean by that. Uh, the main villain of the game, Ultimicia, when we'll get to her in a little bit. This th- this whole thing kind of like this whole uh, a- explanation for the time loop almost completely like get, makes her characterization like because we don't see a whole lot of her in the game, and we know that she wants to do something bad, and <laughs> I was like, why? Well, here's why. So Ultimicia attacked the past and tried to compress time and failed, and. Uh, so, so that happens, and then the time keeps moving, moving forward, and people remember that a sorceress did this, almost like destroyed the entire world, and then condemn sorceresses for generations, like, these sorceresses are evil, they tried to kill us all! And uh, including Ultimicia, where basically they're like, you know, you, the sorceresses are bad, you're a sorceress, sorceresses went back in time to kill us! And basically, all sorceresses are just, like, objectified as uh, just completely evil, even if you're not, you're just, it's almost like, you know, judging a book by its cover type of deal, just because, you know, just because you are a sorceress doesn't necessarily mean that you're evil because some sorceress, uh, you know, like a long time ago did it, right? Uh, you know, now they don't know that Ultimicia did this, but she's, they still pushing her, you're a sorceress, you should be outcasted, you should be killed, and basically it makes her like, all right, you want... You, okay, you want me to attack? Okay, you want me to be bad? I'll be bad. So guess what? They push her into doing this, attacking and trying to compress time because it's like, screw you guys. And then she fails. It's weird, but essentially it's a it's a loop. It has to happen. I'm not, I hope that makes sense. That's about the best way that I can put it. Uh, so... I did read something in my research for this game that the characters are deliberately designed in a European style to feel different, to to feel a little bit alien to the to the, to the to the Japanese audience and to the North American audience, which I can definitely tell that now that they've said that it's like yeah, the character design really is a little weird. Overall, the overall design of the world is a little weird. Anyway, it's kind of got this weird kind of uh, it's uh, it's high tech, but not super high tech until you get the S there. So let's talk about the characters. I got a list of characters, and we're going to talk about that before we start like going into the story and summarizing the story. Uh, Squall, main character, basically, <laughs> he is your like almost stereotypical '90s cool dark hero type. He's very internalized. In fact, you could almost take uh, the amount of dialogue that Squall has in his head. And you know, if, if you take the amount that he says versus and the amount that he internalizes and doesn't tell anybody, he easily has way more dialogue than anybody else in the game. 
Like he doesn't talk much, but but between the two, man, he just talks to himself so much. Uh, he's been training to be a mercenary killing machine by, from the age of five. <laughs> Not only that, but he's also suffering from some PTSD and abandonment issues, which is which has resulted in him putting up defensive walls and becoming emotionally stunted. Uh, he's 17 years old, so that's saying something. It's like you know, it, it, you, like you really don't want to show your emotions at 17. You want to be a man, uh, especially <laughs> if you think about all of that that he's gone through before when he was a kid, and now that he's like a big soldier, he's like, I gotta internalize this. I can't let anybody know. I gotta be strong. Man, that does that does wonders, and that's why he's so internalized, and he, he doesn't really show his emotion a lot, which is why everybody pegs him to be a good leader. <laughs> which is, he's like, why are you making me a leader? Well, it's kind of you're kind of portraying yourself as such. <sighs> ah, man, it, it, his main weapon is the gunblade. It, it's this revolver meets sword, right? I mean, every time you slice, you know, you pull the trigger and you shoot a bullet the same time as you do this big slice, and it's like not really feasible, but it's really cool. Uh, it's definitely a cool factor. Cipher. Cypher also uses a gunblade. He's basically the other side of Squall's coin in, in, in a very lot of ways. He's very egotistical. Uh, you know, he, you know he, uh, he, he, instead of Squall's like very introverted, he's very like outroverted, outroverted, extroverted. <laughs> um, he has, uh, I wrote down, he has a big ego and even bigger dreams. He sees more for himself self than really exists. And I think that's the best way that I could explain Cypher. A lot of people say that he's completely evil. Um, kind of, it's almost like he, he gets lost in that romanticized version. And he even talks about that in the game about his romantic dream, you know, uh, it, you, you will, you know, I'll tell you about my romantic dream. And it's this romanticized version of himself being a lot more than what he is. You know what I mean? It, he sees himself as the hero. That's like the best thing that I can describe it. He is the hero. Uh, what he does, it, it, it's not so much. Now, you can also argue that, you know, you know, did she, you know, because they're because the devs say, from what I understand, that Cipher was charmed into doing everything from all by Ultimatia. I agree and disagree at the same time. I agree that he was charmed. I also disagree in the fact that. He has a strong enough willpower to say, no, I'm not going to do this, but he didn't want to. Did it take a lot to charm him? No, because he got told exactly what he wanted to hear. You know, you do this and you'll have, you know, you know, do A and you will have B because I said. Okay. You're going to make that come true for me. And I'll do it. Does that make somebody evil? Could be, <laughs> especially with you know the, the way that he tortures Squall at some point. Uh, the, the the fact that they were burning towns. Uh, it, it, you know, some of the stuff it, they don't accurately show how dark Cipher goes down this road, but he does. Do I think he regrets it? We never really get that in the game. We we get to see a spot at the end where 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 where, where he smiles at Garden at one point. And I think he does. I think he does regret his actions. Does it? Uh, now, I also like that he doesn't get killed for it, and you know, he does live through it. But I, I definitely could see that as a thing for him, where it's like you know, he does regret that. So let's talk about Quistus. Quistus, she is your teacher in the beginning of the game. She is a seed instructor. Now, Squall's seventeen. She's eighteen. Alone with the teacher, huh? Yeah. She gets demoted because she lacks leadership, she says. And also tends to... I also wrote that she tends to overthink emotionally, especially during the mission of to assassinate the sorceress. There, looking at you. And uh, she thinks she's in love with Squall. At the beginning of the game is really weird. She keeps, like, completing Squall's sentences. And she's laughing about it. And she's attracted to him... And doesn't really know why. Uh, she's kind of hitting on him a little bit. And when she steps down, she tries to like lean on him and talk to him. And he's like, wants nothing to do with her. <laughs> it's really awkward. 
you know, she's thinking maybe by doing this, she could kind of like, maybe they can be closer and it's not happening. Squall doesn't give a crap. And, uh, well, and that all like gets summed up. She goes, I thought I was in love with him, but turns out I was just his big sister. Not really, but, but we'll get there. <laughs> Confused feelings. Zell. I don't, I don't have much to say about Zell. I, uh, he's, you know, he's the loud mouse f- uh, fisticuffs character. Really? Uh, he's con- he, you know, he's comedic relief. And uh, they they use him for like an information dump. Whenever there needs to be some exposition, and a character needs to tell the, you something or the or squall something that he doesn't know, Zell's the guy. He's the guy that they go to, and um, you know he's the he's the punching character. Quistus is actually the blue magic character, but her blue magic is hidden behind uh, limit break. And while you can you, you know you're able to use limit breaks outside of like limit breaks in this game, I I actually didn't touch on that earlier. Limit breaks they they introduce that. Um, like I think they introduced it in six, it's like desperation move, but in seven the you had a bar and when somebody hit you that bar filled up and you could use a limit break. You could even save it for the next battle if you wanted to. You could just you know use it. I oh, man, I got all right. I got a boss coming up. I'm gonna get my. I'm actually gonna go out there and just get hit to get my limits. Heal up. Go go and like smash that boss with my limit breaks. Done it right. With. This one, the the more your health decreased and the percentage, like once you got down into yellow portion of your health, like, I don't know, less than 20%, the odds of you getting the chance to use a limit break went up. So then you would have to continuously ride that line to use your limit breaks and just smash people. But then, of course, later on you got to the game, you got a magic thing called Aura, which allowed you to use the same, you know, use the same thing. So, uh, yeah, there's ways that you can use it and use your blue magic, but really it's like... It, it's not as uh, intuitive, I would say, as like other games would be in the series. Zell, he's the punching dude. Zell's strength stat's actually pretty good. Uh, you know, Squalls is pretty high as well, but uh, Zell, I would say, he was right up there next to him. Uh, Selfie. Man. A lot of characters in this game don't get nearly as much characterization as some of the other ones. Uh, I don't have a lot to say about Selfie. Selfie is perky, and she is basically the mage character, even though, as I said, everybody has access to magic and everybody can kind of use magic. And even if you set them up correctly with the junctioning, you can make anybody anything. Uh, her limit break is using magic. And so she is pretty much the the black mage or just mage. I, I, I would probably say black mage is probably more accurate. But, you know, she is the magic user for sure. Uh, you get some characterization for her. She was at Balam Garden. Uh, you know, training to become a seed, a mercenary. Uh, she was at another garden before, but not much else to say about her. You know, Zell, Selfie, and Irving don't get a terrible lot with Irving coming in dead last with characterization. Renoa, she ends up being Squall's love interest, which is interesting because, like, they do nothing but argue and they don't get along at all in the beginning, and they butt heads a lot. And then it turns into infatuation, which then it turns into, oh my god, I love you, uh, because you're in a coma. I mean, anyway, it's it's it's, a, it's very. Now I've heard it like this love story is terrible. Actually, this love story is pretty accurate for teenagers. <laughs> it's it's really stupid. I don't know if if any of you have ever been a teenager and in love, but some of that stuff is really stupid. <laughs> So Renoa, uh, she's she's a rich kid. She's the daughter of General Caraway. He's like the head of the Galbadian army, like I was saying before. Like you had the president, he's the leader of the country, and he General Caraway is pretty much the number one guy in the military. And his daughter Renoa is a rich kid playing rebel hero, uh, trying to you know end the occupation of another nation state by that military. Now that could be fueled by by rebelling against her own father. Like she could be like all for Timber's uh, occupa- you know, occupation ending, but that could have, that could have been spearheaded by the by by her uh, in contention with her father too. I I don't know. We don't get we don't go full on into that in the game. But also, like their their resistance group, they're just beyond stupid. They she is a kid, basically being a terrorist. And they don't know what they're doing. They're like you, you are liable to get killed. Irving, cool sharpshooter, way into girls, endless flirt. That's what I wrote down, and that's pretty much what we get. 
uh, other than the big uh, information dump that we get in the middle of the game, we don't get much from him. He, uh, a lot of the way he acts is kind of a kind of a defense mechanism because none of the characters remember who he is because they all knew each other as kids other than Renoa. Uh, and, and, and I'll get to that when I actually talk about the story aspect later. But that's it. We don't get much else from him. We don't know, uh, you know, they were all orphans. We don't know who adopted them. We, we don't go into, like, this and that, how he ended up at, at Galbadia Garden I mean, to, to, to train there, become a sharpshooter. Uh, nothing. No. It's kind of... It kind of sucks because this game could have used a lot more, uh, a lot more in depth uh, with the characters. Like we, uh, you, you, you get some with some characters, but it's uh, mostly little things. Uh, let's talk about Swiss versus Adea, or Adea. I, I don't know how you guys say it, or I've always said it as Adea. That's the hard thing about these old Final Fantasy games. You know, Chocobo. I've heard Chocobo, uh, Chocobo. Chocobo, yeah, I've, 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 I, but it's but but it's Chocobo, right? It's got to be. <laughs> and it wasn't until the more recent games that we actually started getting actual pronunciations for things, and the Square being like, "No, it's this." I mean, heck, we didn't even get that until for actual names until like probably ten years ago. So, Sorceress Adea is the villain of this of like the first half of the game. She is a sorceress who is being possessed by the real villain Ultimicia, a sorceress from the future. And after a certain point, Ultimicia stops possessing her. She stops becoming a bad guy, and we have to focus on the real threat. She also, ironically, was the head of the orphanage that all of the characters that we have in the party, other than Renoa, grew up at and is basically their mother figure. Well, that kind of links it all together, doesn't it? Uh, Sid. Headmaster Sid, he's the headmaster of Balam Garden. It trains people to be soldiers, specifically to kill sorceresses, and he is married to Adia. <laughs> he's training people to kill his wife. You can't make this up. He also looks uh, incredibly like Robin Williams in the original PS1 version. The, the, the new remastered version, uh, not so much, no. Uh, but in the original version, the way that it just, you know, the character models outside of the cutscenes, definitely... He, he remind, it met a lot of people. That that became a huge, huge meme. Uh, even before memes were memes, I thought that. <sighs> Laguna. Let's let's talk about Laguna. We only have two more characters really to talk about before I actually start going into uh, the story. Um, and that was and Laguna. He's basically the secondary hero character. There are times in the game where your character and in, in, in cast of characters ugh, you know collapse, and you go into a dream world or the past you're actually viewing the past and uh you play through the past as laguna kairos and ward and follow through some of their adventures laguna he is uh he's probably the most like uh likable character in the game he's my favorite character uh, by far uh, in a lot of ways he like he's the main character of his story even though our story follows a different part um, but he, but he, but his role is very important, and I would uh, love to have a game that just went through his entire arc. That would be awesome, because it, it, like his characterization, it never changes. Even though like you see him in the past and you see him like twenty years later in the future, and he's still the same guy. He's he, he's he's absolutely he talks too much. He gets way too nervous. Uh, you know, I absolutely love the characterization that they did for Laguna, and uh, you know, Kira and Ward are his best friends. You know, like. You know, they're always there. They're always there to help him out and, like, you know, blow him some crap. That's what I loved about when you, when you saw them in the military. Like, they would just blow him so much crap, and it was just so funny. And uh, so when he is actually Squall's father, we never get those words in the game, but it's highly implied. And I'm not sure if they've ever come out and said it, but no, he is he is Squall's father. But we're gonna. Uh, but I'm gonna transition into the last character alone uh, to talk about because uh, we, when, when we view the past, we're uh, we, uh, alone is sending us into the past into another person that that she knew in the past, and we are basically junctioned into them. So so she has the power to junction people into other people, just like we junction our summons into us, the guardian forces of what like what they're called in FF8. 
We junction them into us, which gives us superhuman powers. It gives us the ability to do great things and junction magic and do all that stuff. Well, well, when she junctions us into Laguna, Kairos and Ward, now they have our abilities and our powers. And they and they actually comment that comment that in the game as being like calling it the fairies. It's like like all of a sudden everything's going their way. They're you know they can do no wrong. They they can jump higher. They can fight harder. It's like wow the fairies are here. They're blessing us. It's like they don't know how to explain it. Of course until way later until alone until alone explains it to them. Um, uh, alone is uh, she's a girl. She grew up with Squall. She was raised by Squall's mother until Squall's mom died. Uh, she was kidnapped and Laguna went on this big long thing to go find her. Uh, you know, and then send her back home and, uh, uh, Squall's mom died. They both ended up at the orphanage with Idea, and, uh, yeah. And it's pretty much remained, uh, with the, with the, with Idea's group with, 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 uh, with, with the seeds for a long time. And I don't think she even had reacquainted with Laguna until at the point in the game where she actually does meet up back up with Laguna. Um, but ironically, her powers are also made into a machine. Like her powers to junction people into other people in, in the past is made into a machine that then the sorceress Ultimation in the future is able to use that machine to possess sorcerers in the past. So her powers are why Ultimation can do what she's doing. And with that, we're going to with that we're going into the story. Um, so I don't know if I want to go through one beat for beat the entire story. I can, uh, but I'm, it's definitely going to be summarized. And um, what I first want to comment on is the intro to this game. This intro is badass. It shows scenes and uh, you know uh, a collage a collage of scenes from, from like cut scenes from the game. But then it also has the, the opening training montage of Squall and Cypher training together uh, before the story of the game. And it's all set to this great piece. Li, uh, you know, Libere Fatile is the piece. Of course, the music in this game done by no, N- Nabuo Yamutsu. Nabuo Yamatsu. I'm sorry. Not the, I'm not the best when it comes to, uh, comes to pronouncing <laughs> Japanese names. His music is awesome. Like, if anything else, if you do not like this game, go check out the soundtrack. It's great. It's also the first game in the series to actually use more orchestrated uh, sounds for this, you know, for the soundtrack. I mean, FF7 even used Mid-Eye. So, uh, no, the, it, the soundtrack is, like, is, is great. And the opening track, you know, like, FF7 ended with the big chorus, you know, chanting, you know, uh, with the Sephiroth, you know, theme. You know, One-Winged Angel. And FF8 is the opposite. It starts with it. With the Fethos Lusek, Fethos Winosek, the big intro, and it's awesome. You know, it's big, big and epic. And uh, after that, you know, Squall gets hurt. He's in the infirmary. Uh, you know, he needs to go pass his, you know, his seat exam for that day. So you go off uh, with Quistus, go get his, you know, get a go get a summon, finish that, finish your basically finish your credits before you can go take the exam that day. He goes and takes the exam. Uh, his he's teamed up with Zell, so that's that's where you first meet Zell and Cipher, and uh, Cipher's the squad leader. And uh, because of his decisions, he do, he doesn't pass the exam. You guys do, you know things work out. You meet up with Selfie in that exam. You actually meet up with her before that, uh, and you can give her a tour if you want. Uh, but uh, no, you meet up with her here to team up. You guys get out. You guys become seeds. There's this big party. Uh, coordination for the four seeds that passed this exam. They have a huge ball the, uh, for this for, for for these new four new seeds, and that's Squall, Zell, Selfie, and a character named Nita, who comes back around later. That's one thing I do like about this game. This game actually started giving, uh, you know, some of the uh, you know smaller characters that you meet along the way. They bring them back later with some you know with, you know like, like with some roles, and this would actually be expanded upon with FF9 by just making so many characters like npcs you know uh just for example the old lady selling pickles or uh part-time worker mary or or if, if you know ff9 you know these characters because they gave, they bothered to give these characters specific exclusive design and characterization and that kind of started here in um in uh, in in eight where we actually started getting you know, Nita was somebody who wasn't important at all in the beginning but later on he's the pilot of the garden so 
I actually kind of like that. So at the ballroom is where Skull first meets up with Renoa. She is there to elicit help from Seed to help her resistance against the Galbadia military. Galbadia is a, you know, it, it, it's a nation ran by a dictator. He, he became lifetime president, and uh, they have occupied Timber, which is this nation state. And she goes, they need to be free, and uh, we need help from Seed. Well, while she's there, that's when you get the big ballroom dance between Squall and her. And uh, afterwards, uh, the next day, well, actually, uh, Quistus tells you, pours her heart out to Squall, and he's just like, go talk to a wall. And she's like, oh, no, oh, my gosh. Not really, but, I mean, it, it's kind of cold. It's like, man, it's like, I understand. It's like, he's supposed to be this cool character, but he just can't let, like, anything in, can he? So Squall, Zell, and Selfie are three brand new seeds and get a, and get assigned to a task immediately. They're to go help their timber resistance movement, the the forest owls. And you get there, and their plans are to hijack a train car with the president in it, and then take him away, and then he's their prisoner, and convince him to let timber free. Yeah, uh, that's got, that's exactly what I was thinking too. These guys are idiots. It's like you do realize you are committing a high treason, high felony. It's like it, it, even within our own nation, if you kidnap the president, you're going to be in prison for life, if not put to death. <laughs> it's nuts, and you're doing this to a dude who has pretty much made himself a dictator. Now, uh, the, somehow they do get out of it. It wasn't the real president. It was a yeah, the president had caught wind that he was going to get kidnapped. So the it was a, it, like it was all like a it was a uh, not a sabotage, but a uh, but an imposter. That's the word I'm looking for. It, like it was an imposter. You do a, a boss fight, and the president announces to the world via live broadcast: the ambassador to Galbadia is the new sor- is Soros Residia, and it's that's a big deal in this world because uh, the last major sorceress was an Esthar, and she pretty much ruled the world with an iron fist. And Galbadi and Estar were at war with each other for a long time until they were actually eventually able to topple, uh, a, like a sorceress Adele, which is the that sorceress's name from within. And uh, Laguna played a big part in that. That that was kind of a cool. And I wish we would have, as I said, I, I, w- I would love to see a full thirty-hour game with just his story arc. I think it'd be awesome. There's a lot more you could add to it too to make it fun. After that. You report to the nearest garden, which is Galbadia Garden, because you, you now your yeah because your contract with the Forest Isles is to help them until Timber attains its freedom. Indefinitely, essentially, yeah. So when when you get there, the garden's like, we're going to assassinate the sorceress, and you guys are going to do it. And here's our sharpshooter, Urban Canaeus. So you guys all go, and you guys are set to assassinate the sorceress. General Caraway, the head of the military, is leading this operation. Pretty much to help you assassinate the sorceress, but it's all you guys because he need, he can't have you know he needs plausible deniability. He 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 was never a part of this. If you guys get caught, you guys don't exist to me. Well, it fails miserably, and uh, ciphers you know ciphers there. So here's the thing: um, when they when they were gonna like help Timber, right? When 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 Garden sent the seed members. Cypher was in detention for what he had done during the live mission uh, for for the seed exam. When he found out that they sent three rookie seed members basically uh, to go help the resistance movement fight against their, you know, this dictator president, he got pissed and said no, because he's friends with Renoa, right? They used to date. And uh, they sent three rookie seed members? Screw that. I'm going to help. That's why I don't think he's, he's 100% evil. He went over there to help for good reasons. As I said, I think that he thinks he's the hero. Whereas, you know, he gets there, he grabs the president. You know, he, he's doing everything wrong. <laughs> the wrong thing you, that you want to do. And uh, the sorceress uh, comes out after he grabs the president and basically says, come with me, you know. You know, let him go and come with me. You know, you, like you're a lost little boy. And that pisses off Cypher. But Cypher ends up at the sorceress Society. He's charmed. And is now her knight. You fight Cypher. You fight the sorceress. Somehow you live. Somehow the characters live and they're put in prison. 
And then, of course, Cypher uh, is starts to uh, torture Squall. He's like, what's the true meaning of seed? C- Cypher's been at this garden. It's, it's the same age as Squall since he was like five or six, right? Training to become a seed. And he's like, well, you know what it is. Uh, you, you, you idiot. And he's like, oh, there's got to be some secret that you're told. And it's like, does he really believe that or is he just doing this right now? To really take it out on Squall, some that's something to think about. That's see, that's where it's like I don't believe Cipher is one hundred percent evil, but I think he thinks he he's the hero hero of this story, and that uh, Squall is the villain. You know, all those guys are the villains. Uh, so uh, the sorceress ends up killing the president, uh, right before the assassination attempt, and she just takes over the entire country. <laughs> right now, this is Ultimicia through Adea, right? And she, like she, we don't know what she's trying to do yet. We we don't even know that that's another sorceress inside of a day yet. But uh, she launches a counteroffensive against Garden. Uh, she launches missiles towards Trabia Garden, where Selfie's from, and she's they're going to launch missiles against uh, Balam. So when you guys escape from prison, you split up into two groups. One group's going to go sabotage the missile base. The other group's going to go back to Balam Garden to try and like get them out. And uh, the the one group, the first missiles go off, and like they're gonna hit Trabia, and then uh, the second missiles do go off, but thanks to some tampering, and also the group that heads back to Balam to try and get everybody, hey, hey, their missiles coming, but there's a civil war going on, and uh, and, and the Garden Master, the guy that is the uh, basically owner and proprietary or uh, proprietor of Garden, he fronts all the money, and the headmaster are against each other now. Fun. Especially when we have missiles on the way. Come on, guys. So you, you guys go through this whole thing. Where to, Garden used to be a mobile fortress. So you guys got to make it mobile again. And it works. The missiles miss. Then you get called uh, in front of the Garden Master, uh, who is a big, huge slug dude named Norg. And that's that line that said, you know, that, and that's when you find out that, that, that the Headmaster and the Sorceress are actually married it's like, oh, they're trying to take Garden away from me. And all that kind of stuff. Like, shruff, 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 shruff. And, and, and no, I don't know if they were really trying to go for Job of the Hut here, but they actually kind of nailed it. Yeah, so um, you end up um, crashing into FH, Fisherman's Horizon, which actually long ago used to be a station that would fix these mobile gardens, but that's that's been hundreds of years ago at this point, if not even thousands. Uh, but all these dudes, they know how to fix the garden, so they fix the garden, make it mobile. That's when you run into Galbadia. They're looking for a loan. Uh, so the sorceress is looking for her and burn the place to the ground. That's when you meet it back up with, the, with your crew members that split off to go fight the missile base. Everyone's back together. You know, er- everything's going... As they should, and that ends up leading into the you know eventually you go to Trabia, and uh, Selfie wants to go there. Place got hit pretty bad; a lot of people died. Uh, you know th- there are some some dark scenes, and that's one of the darkest scenes is that when you see you know these were uh, a lot of them were kids, and were killed mercilessly, uh, even though they had nothing to do with the attack on the Sorceress. They were just decimated. And that's when you find out, and Irving kind of comes clean, that he grew up in an orphanage. And as soon as he starts talking about it, some of the other one's like, yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I grew up in an orphanage too, you know, right by a lighthouse. Dun, dun, dun. They all did, except for Renoa. Except they don't remember it, because the summons that you junction into yourself to make you stronger make you forget shit. Convenient. But, but Irving remembers because he didn't start junctioning until he joined your team and selfie uh she found a, a summon a long time ago and secretly junctioned it to herself and didn't tell anybody and had it for a long time and that's why she can't remember it, it it's really man it's <sighs> instead of giving all these characters their own and just the distinct characters and their own backgrounds they decided to make this all like because they wanted Idea here, and then, then the kids here, and also Cipher here because Cipher was there too. Uh, spoiler alert! <laughs> but they wanted them all here and under her. You know, she's the mother figure here, and wanted this whole kind of structure and this whole tree to go uh, like to go around each other. And on one hand, it's cool, but it's like, man, is this like is this is fate? This is like fate 
directed by fate. <laughs> you can't get any more fatey than this. And it is kind of out there. I and and then as, as I said earlier, it does actually to the detriment of some of these characters because for selfie we get the Trabia thing is like one of the last things we get with her, other than her yelling "woohoo, we're flying" when she's flying the airship. We don't get a lot from her. Uh, Zell, we get some stuff from him, you know, early on, and and then when you go to Balum and it's like like, like before you go to Trabia, there's some stuff there. Um, you know, Quistus, you get some stuff here and there. She's up there on, on like like on the main bridge with Squall. You understand that she is a kind of prominent member of of the leadership of Garden now, uh, with Squall, her in Zoo, uh, X U. Uh, I've heard some people say Shu. It's Zoo. I've always called her Zoo. Uh, so, and then yeah, so Irving and Selfie get like the least amount. Like, and Irving is like. Yeah, he's like you like you get him. He's like, oh, I'm I'm a flirt. Oh, I can't shoot. Oh, I don't remember. Like uh, like yeah, I remember. And all you guys don't. It, that's it, man. And 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 that's very sad. And he's also got a really big thing for selfie too. So there's this big garden battle after that where you've made your garden mobile. They've made the Galabadia garden mobile, and now they're all they've pretty much rid the garden of all the kids that were going to Galabadia Garden because Galabadia Garden. Is tied into the Galbadia military. It, if you want to become a seed, you got to go to Balum. If you want, if, if you go to Garden, you can go to these gardens, and they are all set up, and they're all kind of connected. Uh, because, so, like, say if you go to Balum Garden and you actually want to go to the Galbadia military, then you could go and you could transfer to Galbadia to go over there. If you want to, if you're in Trabia, and want to become a seed, or likewise Galbadia, and want to become a seed, then you transfer to Balum. Uh, so it's like. Balam doesn't serve any sort of military. They're like just the like the mercenary force, and Galbadia Garden ties right into uh, you know the military from for for Galbadia. So you have a Gal, so you have a, a mobile fortress full of soldiers against uh, a Galbadia gar- or a, a Balam Garden full of uh, teenagers and kids. But it's awesome. <laughs> it's like one of the best parts of the game. You have this big battle, and then you end up uh, having to rescue Renoa from hanging. Uh, off a ledge for a while, uh, and then uh, you end up like switching back and forth quite a bit between the characters, trying to you know uh, trying to go through and help out during the during during these uh, during these events, and you end up storming the garden, coming face to face with Cipher, defeating Cipher, going face to face with the sorceress, defeating Cipher again, <laughs> and then this time you stomp at Dea so much. Well, where last time she beat you, you pretty much knock Ultimicia out of her, and in doing so, like she's like, Fwah! and then uh, Renoa uh, is now all of a sudden not herself, and she stumbles over to Cipher, whose body is like, I'm, I'm beaten, and then she, she she says something to him. Cipher gets up and leaves, and then she just like, plop. <laughs> Now, there's also like sort of a romance su- a subplot that's been developing in the second part of the story since the assassination mission where uh, she's been very flirty with Squall, especially if you bring her along to back to Garden instead of to the missile base. Uh, everyone's trying to get you two together. Um, I I really don't know why. I know uh, Renault is infatuated with Squall, and Squall realizes this, but doesn't really care. He's kind of uncomfortable, doesn't really care until she goes into the coma. The moment that she is in the coma, now she is gone, and he's like, oh my god, I love you. Oh, please, won't you breathe? You're so cold. Please, i do anything to have you back. So he does. He literally he literally finds out where... He tries to take her to a loan, because he's like, he could take, she could take me back to her past, because she's taking me back into other people's past. And then decides to walk uh halfway across the world. I don't know like if it's really that long, but it, it it's a long way. Uh down these railroad tracks to take her to Esther to meet up with alone. And then like he like he goes off and just does it by himself. The others somehow get ahead of him and catch up. I'm not sure he'll really they never really explain that. But uh he's like basically at this point he's willing to do anything for her. Which is I which is funny. Because, you know, just before he was like uh okay uh, why are you, why are you looking at me that way? Why are you laughing? Okay. <laughs> so, um, going to alone, like the whole point. So it, when you defeated 
Idea. Now, I, I guess I should talk about this point. When a sorceress is killed, or defeated, I guess, and like in this case, when a sorceress is, is killed, she cannot die until she's passed on her powers to someone who's worthy. She will uh, continue to exist and be in suffering until she passes on those powers. Okay. When we defeated Adea, she passed on her powers to Renoa, didn't know it. And then Ultimicia junctioned herself into Renoa. And now is just kind of laying dormant. Because her bet is that he will try to do anything that he can to get Renoa back. And since, following along with the story, she needs a loan. She, is, she has been searching for a loan this whole time. Uh, to try and it, she wants to junction herself into a more powerful sorceress, aka Adele, who is been in captivity if, if from Mistar in space in, in like a space tomb. So that's where you go. You go up into space. It's like, hey, we're here to see you alone. And she's like, I came up here to see my uncle Laguna. Uncle Laguna's in space for some reason. <laughs> Look, I know I'm like making fun of this game a little bit uh, because there's some things that just don't make sense to me. But I really do like this game. This game is a lot of fun to go through. So up in space, boom! She takes over. She takes control of Ranoa. She goes out into space, and she uh, she causes the lunar cry, which is a bunch of monsters on the moon, which will just flow down to the planet. And uh, she she basically unlocks Adele's tomb. The the tomb goes back down to the planet. Cipher, on the other hand, has been uh, getting this thing, this big pillar called the Lunatic Pandora, which has this crystal in it from the moon, which causes the which causes the whole thing, which basically it's like this one-two punch. It's like, boom, boom. The the Lunar Cry is going to get this thing back down here, and uh, Ultimisha is going to take over Adele. So, Renoa's floating out in space. Oh, no. What am I going to do? Life support failing. Squall's like, no, don't go. He eventually has alone try to junction himself, junction him into Renoa's past, and she's like, I don't, I can't. I don't know her from the past, you know. I can only junction people I know in the present to people I knew in the past. So she tries anyway, and they actually do succeed. Because um, then you get to see different takes from different scenes, like the scene from when the, the crew get put into prison. And uh, her dad actually got her out of there, got her and Irving out of there. And Irving was going to take her back home. And she's like, dude, we need to go back and get them out. And Irving's like, I wasn't told to do that. I don't care. They don't remember me anyway, man. I, I just went to follow orders. Like, no, let's go. So they, they come back and break you guys out. The other one is uh, during right before the garden battle, she likes Squall's ring uh, and wants a copy of it. And Zell's like, I'll make you one, but we got to get it from him first. She goes, oh, no, people might get the wrong idea. <laughs> you know, juvenile love or, or infatuation here. And it's like, no, okay, no, that wasn't far enough or, or whatever. But then she takes you back to the moment where Renoa became a sorceress. And she's like, oh, you know, not she's not responding, and she's kind of weighing, and she says something to Cipher. And so she junctions Squall into that moment. And Ultimisha's junction there as well. And we hear Ultimisha for the first time say something to Cipher, tell him to go get the Lunatic Pandora. Because immediately, as soon as she's expelled from Medea, she's already putting together like, like, like a new plan. And because we're there too... She knows we're there. She can sense us or whatever. And that's the first time we see, we, we see like this translucent figure of Ultimisha. She's like, who's there? Get out. You know, and she just kicks us right out of the junction. It's like, holy crap, man. This is some timey wimey crap. So then, uh, alone sends us into Renoa's most present where she's out there dying. And uh, she runs out of air. And Squall's reaching out to her. She hears him or feels him. I don't understand. But then she, you know, uh, she's able to put turn on her emergency five minute air. <laughs> and Squall lunges into space because they're in like this escape pod. They were on the space station. And uh, he lunges into space to go get her. And then he's like, aha, I've caught you. And now we're like, ah, now we're in space. Now what? And it just so happens this big dragon spaceship that Esther had, sh had shot up with that tomb was just floating there for 17 years. A lot of, a lot of, you know, hey, what do you know kind of things in this game. <sighs> Get back. And uh, they want to lock uh, Renoa up right away because they never know when she's going to get possessed again. And 
Squall's like, okay. And then the, everyone else meets back up with Squall. Like, hey, it's been crazy. How you doing? Where's Renoa? Or like, like, like we heard you saved her. And he's like, uh, they took her. And they're like, you're stupid. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I guess you're right. Let's go get her. <laughs> so then you just go and get her back. It's so silly. As I said, teenage love. It's it, it's it's so silly. And uh, so then you get a call from the SR president. And the call is, was from a guy named Kairos. The SR president is Laguna. He's the, he ended up helping them take over, you know, defeat Adel or or Adele, Sorceress Adele, like back in the day, and he became leader of the place. So he went. Uh, he he he's first off. First off, let 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 let's rewind this. During his exploits, uh, he ends up near death, gets found by uh by the town of Windhill, Rain Squall's mother nurses him back to health, puts up with all his crap. They end up falling in love. And she is raising uh, alone as her own daughter because her neighbors were killed during the war. And eventually, uh, alone gets taken uh, as uh, because uh, Adele is looking for a successor for her powers, right? So looking for little girls to move on with the sorceress thing. So he like, I'm going to go and I'm going to find her. And, he, and it takes a while to find her. He eventually does, defeats Adele, sends her back to Rain. Now, Rain has a kid, a.k.a. Squall. And Laguna never goes back. He stays an Esther and is basically made president. I have a problem with that. Like, I, why doesn't he go back? He can't. He has all the ability in the world to, like, to visit, to bring her to Esther. I don't know, because then Rain dies. Squall's still a baby and alone. They both get sent to the orphanage with Adea, right? And then from that point, Laguna didn't know, never knew he had a kid. He didn't know what happened to Alone until more recently. Like she had just been gone. Uh, Alone was being kept safe uh, by Adea and Sid, and he never went back. In fact, he never goes back. Uh, I, I get the assumption that at the very end of the game, in the, in the ending cutscene, when you see, uh, I think Laguna had all the things set. I think he had somebody else do it. Where he had a, a like a headstone and her remains placed on this hill where like where 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 he had proposed to her because we get the because we get this whole scene in the cutscene of him proposing to her and then him walking to her grave uh, at the end of the game and I actually think he never visited once and you can almost see that in his face like they, they do a really good job of like like it's very emotional for him and in fact when you try to talk about rain in the game to him. When you get a chance to meet him, he doesn't like talking about it. And I can see why it is because he feels guilty. I know he does. He cared for her so much. And he was here. And she died. And then he finds out they had a kid. That's, that's some heavy stuff. But it's like, why didn't you just go back? Why didn't you take a loan back? It's like, I know that they would be like, no, you can't leave. You're our leader. And it's like, I mean, you know, maybe they didn't let him leave. I don't know. And I know, I know he wants to help people because that's who, that's who Laguna is. Laguna likes to help people. But so Laguna comes up with this plan to try and go into the future to defeat Ultimicia. That means uh, you, uh, she, Ultimicia is trying to take control of Adele, you, and you have to defeat Adele. Renoa has to take the powers and send Ultimicia and Renoa back in the past to another. Source where she's going to Ultimicia is then going to because I guess Ultimicia can't go any further back in time. I don't understand why. Uh, but when she gets further back in time, she's going to do, do time compression where time is going to collapse on itself. And there's only going to be one realm. And then that's Ultimicia's realm. So and then Squall and the heroes, they survive that trip by believing in each other. And they go and they fight and defeat Ultimicia. And that pretty much makes time explode into a chasm. And everyone's like, you can't get lost in the time. And uh, in uh, Squall and Renoa actually had a place to meet. And like, hey, let's meet here, and that's at the orphanage. It's in this flower field right outside the orphanage. And it's like, you know, this this whole spiel is like, I'll be here waiting for you. You know, let's meet here. Well, Squall does get there, but he's there in a different time. <laughs> in fact, he sees himself as like a little five year old kid looking for his lo looking for his sis, which is alone. And then he gets a, he gets to meet young Idea. Matron, as as they as they called her, and uh, 
it's like she picks up on it right away. It's like, who are you? <laughs> who are, like are you, you're not supposed to be here. And uh, following Squall is the dying Ultimicia. She's also been plunged into time. And Adea is already a sorceress. She became one when she was five. She accepted Ultimicia's powers. So let's think about that. Ultimicia would, like, later on in this timeline, during Adea's timeline, and later in her life would be uh, possessed by the future Ultimicia, while in the past have already gotten her powers. When she meets Squall, Squall kind of tells her about I'm a seed. We, you know, we train to defeat the sorceress and even does the little salute thing and pretty much tells her that she tells Sid, Sid becomes crazed with the idea and like devotes his entire life to creating seed. And that's because Squall told her about it. That's, that's what I mean. Like everything's like, does this big kind of time loop thing? Nothing like everything that, everything that has happened, has happened and everything that will happen will happen. There, there isn't nothing about anything going, anybody going back in time to change anything. No, it, it's, it's, it's time is still doing this. It just does this little whoop and like, like this little, like this little loop. Uh, what else do I have? Um, so squall then from there goes into a void of nothingness and gets lost and essentially dies. <laughs> End of game. No, no. Uh, Renoa uses her powers to reach out for Squall, finds him, and he's like, you know, he, him, him, and his like, like non-respondent body. And essentially, you could pretty much like by the cutscene, you're like, yeah, dude, he's dead. He is dead. Um, but you know, I, I, I think she revived him. Just her power and her presence and pulled him back into the present was enough to save him. I don't really know why or how. Uh, I'm not I'm not versed in time magic. <laughs> so I know that Renoa's powers are are like her sorceress every, every sorceress has like a certain uh speciality, you know. So like uh if you wanted to argue that alone was a sorceress due to her capability of sending people back in time, you could say that her, her power is time magic and even Ultimicia's power is time magic. Um and then uh, Adea is like ice, you know? She does that, like those big ice attacks. And then uh, Adele is destructive. She does meteor and ult- I'm not sure if she does ultimate, but she does like these big flares and, sh- and stuff like that. But then uh, Renoa is more, is more restorative, cure magic. And, you know, she, you know she's a white sorceress. <laughs> uh, or, or in Japan, they actually call them witches. So, yeah, she's a white witch. So Squall is revived and, you know, uh, then the scene goes on to Cypher. We get to see Cypher with his buds, Fujin and Rajin. I never really talked about them. There's really not much to say. They're just lackeys. Um, but then you kind of see him, and he's fishing, and they kind of have a laugh. And it's you see things are kind of good there. He, the the gardens kind of doing like a tour of duty, like a big like victory tour after saving the day. And he smiles up at it. And then of course we get to see the see the Laguna scene where he proposes, and then it's back in the present. And that was like, as I said, I'm actually bothered that he actually didn't. If he actually cared about Rain that much, he should have like said, "You know what, guys, I'll be back. <laughs> you guys want me to lead? I'll be back. I've got to go see her. I love her. I already promised her." That's what gets me, man. Because then watching him walk up to there and him kneeling down, it's the first time he's been there in like 17 years, 20 years, and he hasn't seen her in so long, you know. And she died, and he wasn't there. Like, I'm almost getting choked up about it, talking about it. It's actually, it, 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 like, it's rough. And, y- you know, I don't think he did it on purpose. I don't think he was, like, I just think it just happened. And then, of course, once it's happened, it's something maybe he doesn't want to face. And maybe that's and maybe that's good. Maybe that's the flaw in his character. You know, he, it's, that is the one thing from his past that he can't shake, that he wasn't there. Um, But then, of course, you know, uh, Elone shows up, and there's Carol somewhere in the background, and she's waving at him, and he waves back, and the garden flies over. And then what's cool is that we get kind of like a like a mid credit scene. There's this little roll, like this little B roll. You see some of the characters hanging out. And what can only be assumed is like a celebration after they save the day. You know, there's Irving, Selfie, Quistus, Selfie, <laughs> Selfie, uh, Quistus, and um, Zell, and even uh, Sid, and, and like in a day are there and having a good time, and um, you know, celebrating their victory. You know, they 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 saved the day. Uh, all all was one and. 
there's a lot of goofy stuff in there, like like Zell choking on a hot dog or rolls in Japan, but he's sitting there choking, and that girl and the girl with the pigtails, that's another one. Uh, you know, when I was talking about those characters that they actually give these random characters, which would just be random, uh, you know, r- your random NPCs, give them characterization. They actually gave one to a girl with the pigtails, which was this girl that really likes Zell. And, and, and as I said, that would get better on with FF9, but... Uh, no, the end is where like it shows, uh, you know, on that balcony where Squall was after there a- after that ballroom dance. There's Renoa out there, and then that's when the battery conveniently dies on the camera. You don't get to see who she's out there with or anything. So you're like, did Squall live? Well, there's an after credit scene, well, well before Marvel, uh, and there's Renoa out there looking up at the sky. And of course, the first time that her and Squall meet. We were both looking up and they see a shooting star and then they, you know, Squall looks down and there and she looks up and their eyes lock. Right. So then she sees one. She looks over and Squall's there. She points up and that's the first time Squall smiles in the entire game is at the end. You know, he finally has kind of let that wall down um, emotionally, which is good because that's it. One thing that I don't like is how people are like uh, he, his character just drastically changes. And with the one thing that I, it's not drastic. It is drastic as far as him falling in love with Renoa. That was very fast. So that is true. What what I do like is that after like the first disc, or if you're on the old PS1 version, or the first 10 or, or 12 hours, he does start caring about his comrades more. And when he does vocalize that, they're like, wow, you actually said that? And he gets kind of upset. And you're like, hey, what, well, what's wrong? I care, you know? But it, it is gradual. You know, these are people that he's kind of become to trust and and, uh, and 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 kind of be fond of being around. And even though he doesn't like to rely on anybody, he's come to realize by the end of the game that he does have to rely on people and his friends. And then also Renoa. It's like, we need each other. They need me. And that is growth. Uh, I, I know that there are some people who who do criticize, it's like, and like well, being introverted is bad. They, they point out that him, talk, him thinking to himself so much is bad. It's like, well, I think they're really trying to get him to just voice that a little bit more. And I personally don't think Squall changes as far as who he is as a person. Other than the fact that he's a little bit more or less guarded around those that he trusts. Especially those core of friends that they went off and saved the day, went to the future, defeated a sorceress. And then, of course, he fell in love with a girl and flew out into space to catch her. Um, I think to those people, he's probably going to be a little bit more open. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's still sort of just in here because that's just who he is at this point i mean he has a lot to deal with and it makes you wonder how that would change because uh laguna does tell him hey uh when this is all done we need to have a big talk and i can completely understand if you don't want to hear it but just put it out there and then you go talk to kairos and more it's like wow you really look a lot like your mom yeah and then it's like you go talk to ward it's like Ward, you know, Kairos is like, Ward says it's a good thing that you don't look a lot like your dad. You know, Ward's blowing Laguna's shit all the way at the end. I love this. I love those guys. I love that relationship. Uh, but yeah, everybody lives happily ever after. So, like, that remaster just came out. Of course, this remaster is like 20 years later. What did I think of it? Uh, I have the remastered versions of 7 and 9. And 8 also fails in the uh, area of the backgrounds. For, like... When you're walking around on, on, the, on the map or in an area, those are all pre-rendered. And they did some things to kind of make them 1080p or 720 whatever it was. But they just look blurry to me. Uh, 8, I, if I can be honest with you, I think 8 looks the best out of the 3. And I think so far, just based upon my vision, I know I got, I know I got glaucoma. <laughs> and I, and my meds make my eyes look bloodshot like crazy, like like I look like I'm like infected from like uh, like The Last of Us or Resident Evil. But nine looks the worst because nine they put moving things in the background and it just looks man it was grainy and I'm like it looked bad to me. And I, I know I've heard they have AI programs that make it look a lot better. And why they didn't do that, I don't know. The character models for for this version of, F, of FF8, this is something that they didn't do for the other ones. They just made the character models look shinier and better. And actually, FF9's character models look so good that even 20 years later, they actually look almost as good as the brand new models they made for this game. These This game is made off of new models. They almost look like PS2 models or PSP models. Uh, I think Squall and Laguna both, maybe even Ultimicia, are like their models are based off of, or maybe even ripped directly from the Dissidia game. So, uh, you know, that was a PSP game, and 
they look fantastic. They're they're absolutely crazy. Like they look so good. So you have one plus, one negative. Uh, the the cheats that you get with the console version, because I got the Switch, you get the speed times three, which is good, uh, but I'll get to that in a minute. You have uh, no encounters. Now, no encounters is something that you can get in this game anyway if you get the ability from Diablos, you know, one of the summons. You can say, I want learn encounter none. Then you equip that, you have no more random battles. And the no encounter thing in this game works exactly the same as that because when you have areas where encounter none wouldn't work, it, your your cheat doesn't work. So it's cheap. There's also a mode that will basically make it to where you take no damage. It's God mode. Boom. Okay, I didn't get hit. Boom. Okay, I didn't get I didn't get hit. And you always have your limit break. But as far as mega cheats go, I think the Steam version got all items, all GFs maxed out, uh, all cards, all abilities. You can really make a cheap cheat on the PC version. And it's a shame that isn't in the console versions too because uh, while you get God mode and can't die, it still takes you forever and a day to kill stuff if you don't level. And it's like, why can't you just go boom? If you're just wanting to powerhouse and cheat your way through the game, boom. Why can't it just be that way? It is on the, it is on the PC. It is on the Steam. But it's not on the Switch. So that times three mode is really helpful for when you're grinding. Especially when you're drawing magic. It makes You can just put your cursor on memory so that way you're always drawing. Do, 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 do. And you can also turn on the little god mode. The god mode does three things. I, I missed one. It gives you the limit break all the time. It makes it to where you never take damage. Uh, and it also makes it to where there's no ATB bar. It just, boom, it's automatically your turn. The next turn after you attack, your, your thing is up. So you can just keep... So I so I just hold the A button, and I'm and I'm just drawing spells. It is like so the cheats are there. The 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 cheats make it to where the grind is less of a grind, but it's still a grind. If I'm going to cheat in a game, I shouldn't have to grind. That, that goes beyond the point. So, like, it does bug me that it didn't have the rest of the cheats. The PS4, the Xbox One, and the Switch version don't have those all items, all abilities, all cards. for you. The ways for you to refine and get all the stuff and just set your guy up, you know, get all magics. It's like, no, you have to go out and you still have to cheat your way through that. Is this a game that you should play today? It's $20. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I think if, if you like RPGs, if you played some of the Final Fantasies and you haven't played them all, I think it's I think you owe it to yourself to try and find a way to play through all of them or at least attempt to. You know, cuz there's even ones that I haven't, you know. I uh, I've never played through 12. But I went out and I bought 12 on the Switch. After playing 8, I'm like I need to play I I, I need to beat 12. Cuz I I like it, but I it's different and it's like that difference is like um uh, intimidating to me. And because and it's, and I can see why the junction system would be intimidating to somebody who doesn't understand it or or, or doesn't like you're sitting there and, and they're just like mind numbingly telling you bloom, slowly telling you how to do stuff. And you're like, I don't care. I just want to play the game. Yeah, no, uh, I need to go look up some some, you know, some strategies for 12 to, to make the battle, you know, come easier to my brain. Uh, because it is different, but I, I want to do it. You know, I want to beat that one. I've never beat it. I, I've beaten a lot of the other ones. I haven't beat that one. And then, you know, I, I never beat five either. I, I would like to go back and beat five. And five is one that's easy accessible. I have it on the GBA. I could get it on Steam. And, you know, and like, you know, like if for anybody who hasn't beaten some of these, you know, there are current ways to play a lot of these, especially if you have a PC. You can, uh, they may not always be the best version, but then you, you know, you have, if you have an Xbox One, you have access to 7, 8, 9, 10, 2. You're 10, 10, 2, uh, uh, 12. And then the 13 trilogy on, on Xbox One, the 13 trilogy, that's all backwards compatible. And then, you know, then, then you have 15. All those are on one console. Same with the PS4, except for PS4 doesn't have the 13s. But, yeah. You know, there's even a, a Play Asia deal going on right now where you can pre-order FF7 and FF8 double pack. For forty bucks, you know they're each twenty bucks a piece. So, but with this, it's forty bucks. You get a physical copy of the game. You get two games on one cartridge, and uh, you get English di uh, uh, text options because it's through Play Asia, which is like kind of like in the eight. It's like it's Singapore or a Hong Kong area, so like they have English options for this stuff. I actually ordered a a copy of the Resident Evil One uh, remake. The it's the Resident Evil One remake remaster. <laughs> 
it's the remastering of, of the remake that was on the GameCube. And uh, you can choose English or Japanese text. And it, it's kind of cool because, you know, if you order it from Japan, it's still going to be all Japanese. You can't switch. If you order it in America, you're not going to have all Japanese text. If you order it from, from, the, from the Asia market, you can pick. And that's awesome. And I'm tempted. I really am. I don't have seven for the Switch. I tell you what. If it had nine, if they had a triple pack for 60, seven, eight, nine on the Switch, even though I already have eight uh, digitally and I have seven and nine digitally on, on, on the PS4, having those three on one single cartridge uh, for one price, it would be hard to say no. Uh, so, yeah, please, uh, it, please, if, if you enjoyed this, man, I hope you did. Please let me know what you think. This is something completely different. I might do this for some other games, uh, maybe not just excluding, you know, not including the FFs. Um, I'm thinking... Like the next one I kind of want to do is The Last of Us with all the hype from Last of Us Two or Part Two and then in the new and it getting released next year. Uh, you know, The Last of Us was the first uh, game stream I ever did, so I kind of want to do a deep dive of the first Last of Us and talk about that in depth. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you did, this is completely different. Uh, uh, I hope I did this game justice. I don't know if I did, I, especially when I'm sitting there just recapping the story. I know I jumped around trying to make it funny and entertaining, but I enjoy Final Fantasy VIII. Uh, I I do think it is a positive experience. I think that if I had to give this game a rating out of ten, that's difficult to do, especially you know uh, with all the great games that have come out now. Uh, I still think it holds up. I think it's an eight out of ten, uh, e e even with its flaws. And and that's the thing is that to me, there's no perfect game. There's always going to be flaws. You know, uh, seven has its flaws, and it's, it's my favorite game of all time, and I love it. That's what love is, man. You look past the flaws. But I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Game Addicts Podcast. This is a new series called Deep Dive that I'll be doing from time to time. Uh, please go check us out on our social media as a Game Addicts Play on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, check out the podcast and all the podcast places up on Apple, Spotify, iHeart. Do we're on Stitcher, we're on all these places. Check out the YouTube channel. If you if you're listening to this, you made it all the way through this. Me rambling and talking. If you made it all the way through this, go check out our YouTube channel. It's your one stop shop for everything that we do. We do the video podcast. We do the video game gameplay uh, when you know when we can. Uh, I'm playing through Mass Effect series right now over there. Uh, that's starting to slow down a little bit. I need to do another entry on that. I was doing like two episodes a week, and now I've done like one, and I need to do one for this week. <sighs> I'm starting to get close to that baby, and I know it's going to take up more time. So, but I am going to finish. I'm in the. I, I'm like halfway through Mass Effect Two. I'm going to finish the entire trilogy. I, that is a promise to you guys. I am going to do it, and then I'm going to move on to something else. I don't know what it's going to be, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll try and make it fun and entertaining. And when I can, I'm going to try and stream some more. Maybe I'll just start trying to stream some like games I could just play and chill out. Not so much of like I got to do dedicated. Uh, a gameplay entries or talk so much, just chill out, chill out games, some old Super Nintendo games or anything like that. So, until next time, guys, I've been Brando. Thank you for joining me for this very special episode, this deep dive into Final Fantasy VIII. Have a good one, guys. Game on. Later, guys.